Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our afternoon workshop here on Wednesday um, during our second annual What Works conference at Kenyon College. My name is Alex Alderman. I'm an instructional designer with the Center for Innovative Pedagogy here. And uh, this afternoon, we're going to be, um, uh, you're going to be uh, in a workshop um, with uh, David Katz, who is a professor emeritus at Mohawk Community College. Um, and um, before we, uh, at all our events, we uh, try to make a land acknowledgement statement. Uh, Kenyon College acknowledges that the lands on which we live, work, celebrate, and heal are the ancestral homelands of the Miami, Lenape, Wyandot, and Shawnee peoples, among others. The disputed Treaty of Greenville of 1795 and the forced removal of indigenous peoples from this region allowed for the founding of the college in the early 1800s. As a community, we are committed to confronting this dark past while also embracing through education and outreach the many indigenous communities who continue to thrive in Ohio. All right, and with that said, um, let's uh, go move over to uh, Professor Katz for integrating emotional intelligence and growth mindset to create equity, uh, empower, build self-efficacy, and grow intelligence. So uh, take it away, Professor Katz. Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you all for being here. I am excited to share with you this afternoon. I know I am speaking uh, to fellow travelers and preaching to the choir. Um, and I hope that in some small way, uh, we can um, together sort of grow our um, ability to positively impact our students and create a sense of inclusion and empowerment. So. Um, I do this work all over the country, and I want to start by sharing what I think is really um, the critical foundational premise to all of this work and a critical insight and foundation into any college and any educator's work in trying to establish an environment based on equity and inclusion where people feel valued and welcomed. And that fundamental premise is that people, all human beings, certainly the people that um, we are sharing learning communities with in our classrooms are fundamentally first and foremost emotional beings. And that emotional lens is through the lens through which we process our reality. That is so critical because emotions are tied to chemicals in our brains, in our bodies. There are chemical cousins associated with emotions and the emotions of exclusion and the emotions of not feeling valued and the emotions of feeling hopeless or like I don't have the tools I need to succeed. Um, have chemical cousins that are destructive to learning and persistence and creative thought and motivation. So we want to deal with the role that emotions play and attempt to develop tools and skills so that we can impact the emotional state of our students to the good in a manner that creates um, chemical responses in their body that actually improve their ability to learn and empower them to grow and give them a sense of safety and inclusion. So that's, that's the goal. And I want to, throughout this afternoon, there's gonna be opportunities for interaction. And, and I want you to both share your experience with me and please with our entire group. And if you have any questions at any time, they are always welcome and they're always appropriate. Okay, so here we go. All right, so this is, um, this is all of our worst nightmares, right? When we're up in front of a class, this looks like some um, highly selective military academy and these folks are down for the count. What uh, I want to suggest here and get us at least thinking about is that clearly there is a lack of engagement. And what I would suggest is there is a lack of a resonant emotional connection with whomever is speaking. When we see this as teachers, 
very often um, our tendency, because it's so painful for us emotionally, is to kind of blame the victim and come out with um, statements like, I have poor students or my students are unmotivated. I would, I would suggest we're at a crossroads as great educators when we come to this and that the reaction I'm hoping we have isn't I'm a poor teacher or that they're poor students, but simply that I'm not reaching them. I'm not connecting them. And that's an appropriate conclusion. And then I have to do something else. I need to engage them emotionally. I would, I would ask you to look at that blue line and think of that. Um, it, metaphorically, it's like a pipeline. Now, if this was a pipeline delivering oil, you have this tremendous reservoir of knowledge and content. And your hope is to share that with your students in a way that will empower and uplift them. For the reservoir of oil to get to the homes and heat the homes or your reservoir of knowledge to get to your students, there has to be a pipeline. And in this metaphor, the pipeline is relationship, a safe, caring relationship that ameliorates the stress that comes with feeling excluded, not a part, overwhelmed or misunderstood. So when we see things like this, I'm hoping that we're going to um, develop or refine our toolbox and have things we can do to recapture not just their attention, but to create that sense of involvement and inclusion. Without involvement and inclusion, there is no equity because people aren't able to perform to their highest level when they feel disengaged or unsafe. Okay, so if you could take a moment, you, everybody can read this, please. I wanna lose my manners. Okay, I'm not telling you anything that you haven't heard before. There's a whole body of evidence that suggests one of the most critical elements in whether a student persists, especially a student that does that from a diverse background that is already feeling less comfortable or less familiar with college. A student from um, a minority population that societally has already suffered from a sense of exclusion or not being valued. What is so critical to these students persisting and graduating is creating that sense of belonging and inclusion and give, empowering them and giving them a sense of value and a sense of efficacy. And that's what we're gonna be talking about this afternoon. How does that look on the ground? How do we operationalize that? So we're gonna operate on two levels, just like these dual computers. On the one level, I'm going to share what I hope are insights that'll allow you the knowledge isn't enough, but also the skills that you can use in your own pedagogy to help you create an environment where students feel more included, are more engaged, they feel safer and they feel like they have opportunities to succeed regardless of where the levels that they come in at. So you're giving them skills to help them be successful in your class. The second level is we want to overtly teach them about the role that emotion plays and their ability to perform and learn and about what inclusion and exclusion does and how to um, develop the emotional intelligence to be able to cope with the stress that they experience in their college and in their lives and help them be more successful as they move on. So we're going to start. Here is a foundational principle 
um, around that idea that people are fundamentally emotional creatures. And it is through an emotional lens that we view the world. The part of our brain that evolved first, where the uh, that emotions reside in, and those powerful chemicals of high alert or stress or fear, when we're scanning the environment for threats, which is a primal process we all go through, whether it's the middle school lunchroom and where do you sit, or when you're walking down an unfamiliar street, or when you're lost in the woods, or when you're meeting a new person and you're trying to determine friend or foe, is this somebody that I can be comfortable with? Is this somebody I'm safe around? We are constantly on a conscious and unconscious level responding to and scanning the world in that manner. This, when we experience stress, anxiety, fear, a sense of exclusion, a sense of not being valued, all the elements around a lack of equity and a lack of a sense of belonging. The chemical cousins, and I would ask you to please, you, you probably know this, but just to draw the connection, the chemical cousins of stress and anxiety and a lack of belonging and exclusion and feeling like you don't have the tools to succeed or the support to succeed, a lack of equity, are cortisol and adrenaline. And cortisol and adrenaline are designed for to put us in a reactive, highly charged state so we can either fight the threat or the middle guy, my preferred response, run like crazy, flight from the threat, or sometimes that freeze response. Just don't move. So I hope you don't get discovered. Or if, if any of you saw the Academy Awards, when Will Smith got up and slapped Chris Rock, you saw the freeze response everywhere. But at that point, here's what I want us to understand. The chemical response to stress, like exclusion, stress, like a lack of equity and feeling like you don't have the tools that you need to be successful in the environment you're in. The adrenaline and cortisol, it hijacks the frontal lobe where cognition takes place and leads us to that reactive state of fight, flight, or freeze. Stress inhibits cognition. This is why we say take a deep breath, count to 10, don't say something you're going to regret. We all know that in a high state of fear, alert, or low states of anxiety, it's harder to think clearly. And that is not a lack of character. That is our, our humanity coming out. When we feel devalued, excluded, fearful, and this adrenaline and cortisol is coursing through our system. We can't think clearly. Now, I want to share something with you. And I'm not proud of this, but I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about this impact and then move to how we can help resolve this with our students. I was in Montreal in the year 2000 on my honeymoon with my brand new wife. And she said to me, let's go to the Montreal Botanical Gardens. So off we went. This is a picture of them. They're beautiful, hand in hand. I'm not as dumb as I look. When she said that, I said, of course, honey, because I was on my honeymoon. So off we went, hand in hand. And we're strolling through the grounds of the Montreal Botanical Gardens. And in this dense um, thicket of bushes and flowers and things like that, I heard this rustling and it startled me. And in my tiny little pea brain, I just reacted as if the Montreal grizzly bear, there's no such thing, was gonna pop out of those bushes in a moment. 
And if any of you bothered to look at um, the stuff that I sent yesterday, along with my background a little, if you were curious, I was a college basketball coach for 10 years, as well as being a professor for 38 years in the uh, State University of New York system. And to make money to get to graduate school, I was a professional dance teacher at an Arthamari dance studio. Now, I don't want to brag, but I used all my moves. And in that startled state, I kind of jumped back, did this spin around thing. And somehow at the end of it, my wife landed, my brand new wife landed in front of what I thought was the Montreal grizzly bear as if she were a human shield. And this is what popped out of the bushes. This is actually a true story. That's why you can't share it. I kid you not about an eight ounce chipmunk. Now that chipmunk looked kind of buff. So I was glad I got out of the way, but I had a whole other problem because that woman was looking at me like she had just made the worst mistake of her life. And I had a lot of explaining to do. Now here's the key. Once I realized I wasn't gonna get eaten by a grizzly bear and my fear dissipated and I was able to collect my thoughts and I looked into my wife Marilyn's eyes, I started to think. But that's the key. I then started to think. And I tried to come up with excuses. And I said things like, oh my God, you don't have to worry about me. Isn't that funny? Um, I'm so careful. You never got to worry about me coming home. My head's on a swivel. But I threw her like a human shield in front of the threat. I am wondering, have you ever had a moment where under fear or anxiety or frustration or high levels of stress, that you reacted and did something that had you thought about it, you wouldn't do. This was not my highest self. This isn't how I would have hoped to have behaved. This was simply me in a state of high anxiety and fear reacting. Stress and fear inhibit cognition. Our students of diversity that come to us living in a society where there is an underlying sense of you're not okay or a lack of inclusion and a sense that the cultures that they come from aren't cultures that we're as familiar with and that we don't necessarily know how to reach them. All of that anxiety inhibits their ability to think clearly to problem solve, to feel safe and comfortable in our learning environments, and ultimately then to succeed. We have to address their emotional state and the, the negative impacts of stress that comes with a sense of exclusion or a lack of inclusion or of not being valued. Think about all of our lives. This is a primal response. This is not a character issue. Any changes in an environment, we're scanning, we're looking for potential threats, the, the potential threat of a microaggression, the potential threat of somebody not understanding me, or you're having a class that I'm not gonna be able to pass. The stress response that inhibits cognition, Think of our students and actually our lives, especially in the past few years. There are so many things that conspire to put our students in a state of high alert and especially our students from diverse backgrounds. How do we help them? How do we create equity and give them opportunities to be successful in our classrooms and give them a sense of safety and a sense that they belong? Okay, here's the good news. The antidote to the stress response is igniting the reward pathway. What's the reward pathway? Well, we're hardwired in our brains that when, when we behave in ways that dramatically improve our ability to survive over 
millions of years of evolution, there's this reward cycle that's put in place. When we behave in ways that dramatically improve our ability to survive, there's a different set of chemical cousins that get released into our systems. You've heard of them. These are feel good hormones and drugs, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, endorphins that actually, instead of hijacking the frontal lobe, they open up the learning centers of the brain. When we feel safe, secure, valued, a sense of belonging, what actually happens is our ability to focus for cognition, problem solving, and creative thought improves. That sense of belonging and safety that comes with being valued and known and cared about powerfully alters the emotional state of our students. And when it alters the emotional state, it alters the chemicals that are coursing through their system and the chemical cousins, when we ignite the reward pathway, lead to a sense of empowerment, an ability to learn and grow and be creative, and a sense of safety to dare to venture into learning and growth. Okay. So the $64,000 question is, uh, so how do we do this? What is this? What does this look like on the ground? How do we operationalize igniting the reward pathway? We're going to talk about three conditions and we're going to practice skills and start to think about how we operationalize what it looks like on the ground in our learning environments to develop pedagogy that consciously is trying to ignite the reward pathway, ameliorate the stress response, and lift our students up by giving them a, a boost, an emotional state with a chemical body composition that puts them in a position where they're able to focus, persist, and learn. Okay, so here we go. The first way, look at that picture and look at that little boy. The first way we ignite the reward pathway in our students to ameliorate the negative impacts of the stress response that comes from exclusion and a lack of equity and a fear they don't have what they need to be successful, either externally or internally in themselves, they, they don't have that sense of efficacy, is the sense of safety that comes from believing you are not alone in your struggles and in your hardship, and that you have with you like that dog, this is what this little boy believes about this dog. That dog cares about him. That dog is watching over him. That dog wants to help him. And that dog would never hurt him. He feels safer. He feels valued. And what happens is when that little boy is starting to, because of stress or anxiety or a medical condition, give off the signs like he might lapse into a seizure and that dog is aware of that and begins to engage with him more affectionately and aggressively affectionately. It can literally alter the chemical response in that child's brain. And you know, veterans have these kinds of dogs. And we know that the elderly, when they are placed in positions where they feel alone and isolated and they don't have people directly caring for them, 
their immune systems begin to break down, their levels of depression go up, and they literally do not live as long. We know that cancer patients that are fighting that incredible disease without a support system do not do as well in dealing with the treatments and their success rates aren't as great. We know from our first euphoric love as adolescents, when we were in the presence of this person and the, the oxytocin and the dopamine was coursing through our systems, that when you are in the presence of somebody you believe to be your wingman or wing woman, the chemical response and that sense of safety and of being valued is critical to your mental health, your ability to focus and your ability to take on challenges. So the requisite to creating a sense of inclusion and a sense of equity is for us to create these safe, caring, resonant relationships with the students that we interact with. And that every interaction, our paradigm becomes, I want to impact their emotional state to the good. I want to, in the way I email them, text to them, talk to them on a screen, or talk to them in person, to create a sense that they are valued and cared for, and I am there to help them, and I want them to succeed. If we can master that, when our students are in our presence, whatever that means, we will begin to alter their emotional state to the good and begin to create a sense of being valued and included and like, maybe I have a chance to be successful because I have this guide, I have this help, I have this support. I was a um, lifeguard my four years through college and I taught swimming and water safety to young kids. The first lesson around the pool of the lake was the buddy system we would teach them that you are safer when you are not alone. The medical industry has confirmed this, both in terms of physiological and mental health. And educationally, we need to understand and tap into this insight. Around the water, if you go down and you're by yourself, your chances of survival are greatly less than if you went down to the water and struggled and you had a buddy. And we teach the kids, you can reach, throw, or tow to get them to safety. And if you can't do any of that, you can scream at the top of your lungs so somebody comes down that can help them. We all need buddies. So we want to be the buddy and we want to teach them that they need buddies in order to, to feel a sense of inclusion and in order to have resources so that they can be successful. So those two levels we're operating on. What does that look like? Here's a, a powerful little snippet, a video um, that, uh, from Brene Brown that I wanna share that'll help give us, um, oops. <sighs> Everybody hearing this? Sure. Okay. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. 
I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Okay. Um, let me go to the, back to our PowerPoint. Oops. the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is. Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. I guess I need to stop that first. Okay. Um, my apologies. This was a bit clunky. I've started um, going back to doing these things in person. And boy, do I like that better for these obvious reasons. So everyone could see this screen? Somebody give me a um, thumbs up or? Yep. Okay, thank you. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I wanna, um, I wanna play around with this because the knowledge that empathy is a critical component to developing um, a safe, caring, resonant relationship that ignites the reward pathway, alters people's brain chemistry, um, from stress to something that's going to give them a sense of empowerment and inclusion and hope. Um, it's a skill. So I want to play around with it in this way. It's called rapid fire empathy. It's fun. You're going to, I'm going to in a moment, break us down into groups and you're going to get to complain about anything. Now, I don't want big um, macro complaints about your life and where it's going. That would take too long. I'm talking about little 30, 60 second snippets about the traffic today, the coffee was crappy, um, your kids are driving you nuts, um, uh, the, the, the meetings that I, I have are getting in the way, or I'm so frustrated, X, Y, or Z. And then your partner is going to practice leading not with solutions, not with sympathy, but with empathy. I want, uh, here's a pro tip. You don't try to solve somebody's problem until they ask you for your advice or to solve it. Until then, when they're coming at us stressed and anxious, um, the first, the most appropriate, the most powerful response, we lead with empathy because we have to, like Brene Brown says, First, create the connection. You're not alone. Crawl down there with them by having an empathetic response, tone, eye contact, body language. We've got to create the sense that they are safe, they're not alone, and that we really care before they'll be calm enough for their cognition to be turned back on. Because remember, in a state of high anxiety, a state of hopelessness, of feeling overwhelmed, they're not thinking clearly. So all we're going to do is, let me get to our breakout rooms. 
Okay. So I am seeing that we have right now um, 10, nine people. So we're gonna, I'm gonna create, uh, let's see, recreate, and we're gonna go three rooms. And then you guys are gonna break out and then you're just gonna go round Robin, quick complaint, and then respond empathetically. All right, and do that for a couple of minutes, then we'll reconvene and talk about how that works. Um, so what did you what did you think about that and just the whole idea of this paradigm shift of when students come to you in any form of stress or de-stress, instead of thinking of solving their problem, to think of creating an empathetic connection that alters their emotional state. So maybe at some point the problem can be addressed. Was it easy? Was it hard? Do you guys, have you already mastered that? What was your experience when you tried to lead with empathy? Go ahead, anybody, help me, please. Christine and I um, were uh, just reflecting on, it's actually pretty challenging, especially, you know, Christine and I are strangers and sometimes students come in, we, we, we may not know them very well. Right. And so just sitting in that listening space, because I think as professors, sometimes we are problem solvers. We are we, in this space, the mm -hmm. yakking space. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a little bit, you know, how, how do you know how long to, to sit with just the listening? Um, and, and, and so that was something we kind of reflected on. Yeah. Good. Somebody else want to share? And again, if it's possible for you all to have your cameras on, um, would find that very helpful for us connecting with each other um, and being able to, you know, share and have these conversations. Was somebody else? Um, any observation? Go yeah, ahead, Lauren. Um, em and I went a little deeper um, into our conversation. Uh, okay. We weren't good with the surface stuff, um, but we kind of discussed how it can be challenging as if you know to be a white person or white passing and we have students of color who come to us with very you know deep concerns how we can be empathetic um without them feeling like we're an adversary or making them feel like we won't understand where they're coming from because their challenges are so inherently different yeah you know one of the things that i've because this comes up a lot is you may not be able to empathize with their circumstance, but what um, we could empathize with is the feeling that the circumstance elicits, right? We've all been in a place where we have felt like we weren't valued or people didn't understand us or where we came from, or we were excluded for something superficial or people didn't even take the time to get to know us. So having that sense of, and for us having the confidence to know this is a human being, I haven't walked a mile in their shoes and I can't possibly know what it's like to live the life they've lived, but these feelings they're experiencing as a result of it I can, I can use them and tap into them to develop these empathetic responses. And Lauren, I think it's so powerful that at that point, think of how much trust we have to build before this person that is so different than us is going to be somebody we're really going to let in and be comfortable enough to, to allow them to guide us. So I would say err on the side of sitting with empathy much longer when we start to give solutions to problems. I wonder if somebody from a very different background is thinking, you have no idea, dude, all the crap I'm dealing with. And when you give this solution, there are 16 other things that make this solution hard that you would never understand. So to give solutions long before you've developed that empathetic, caring, trusting relationship probably feels like you just think you're smarter than me because you're this white, highly educated fill in the blank. Um, and this is what I've had my whole life. 
you starting to tell me what I should do or give solutions to my problems when you have no idea about my life is going to create anxiety. It's going to actually, it's not going to feel helpful. It's going to feel like, oh, this is more of the same. It's, it, it, I know it's such a damn conundrum because we think we have things they can do that'll be productive. So, um, okay, this is um, just me being completely transparent. You know, the woman that I threw in front of the chipmunk so heroically on my damn honeymoon, she's a clinical psychologist. So my guess is she married me because I'm an interesting case study more than anything else. Um, but here's my point. I don't want to give you all the impression for a moment that I always get this right. Um, my go-to, and, and maybe this will help us. When there's somebody I care about or care for, or I'm in a position where I'm supposed to be helpful, like I'm a teacher, I'm a professor, I'm your coach, I'm your mentor, you have a problem, I'm supposed to help you solve it. And then I want to tell you how, what I think would be the best way to solve because I have all this experience, although you have no experience in their lives, right? That's the, that's the humility piece. You have no experience there. You have experience in how you solved it and how you navigated in the conditions you came from and that I came from. So long story short, um, I told you I coached college basketball. Um, I would go running with my wife and be running up a hill and she'd be having difficulty and I would immediately go into coach speak and start saying, come on, you can do this. Look, all you need to do is open up your chest and pump your arms more and breathe deeply. We'll slow up. And she does this thing where her head, it turns like 360 degrees, just like in that old movie about the possessed. What was that? What was that called? Exorcist. Thank you. Like the exorcist, right? And then in her eyes, I can see they're burning a hole through me and she goes, you are not my coach, and I did not ask you for advice. I'm just, I'm just feeling frustrated, and I'm just venting, and I just want you to hear me. She's looking for empathy, and like an idiot, I'm giving her advice about all the things she needs to do to get up that hill. So I screw up on this all the time. It's hard. And here's what um, the insight that I have, and I wonder if any of you, I'd, I'd like to hear if this is germane to you at all. I feel inadequate when somebody I'm supposed to be helping is struggling. And I want to get out of that sense of anxiety. So I start blurting out solutions. And what I'm hoping is they go, oh my God, David, thank you. You're so smart. I'm so glad you told me that. My life is so much better now. I'm just going to do what you said, right? And then I feel better. I'm not anxious anymore. I know it comes from that place. And it's so hard to hold. And in, because in, when I identify with their sense of hopelessness or their anxiety or their fear, I have to be in that place a little bit and let them continue to say, um, how they're feeling. Um, and then that makes me feel a little inadequate because I haven't helped them. Does, does that, res do any of you, does that make sense maybe on some level that that might be happening a little bit? Yes, anyone want to share an experience or just try to <laughs> go, Em? Um. Thank you so much. By the way, um, one of the things I want to model is when somebody is kind enough to help you and M, you, I think you were probably experiencing a little empathy for, I'm saying, please, somebody talk, say something. Does this resonate with anybody? And, and you chose to, is express that gratitude and appreciation. Value participation. Do not, this is huge. If you want to create that sense of inclusion, don't ever value correct answers. Value attempts to participate. That is also in alignment with growth mindset and the neuroscience around how we grow our brains and grow intelligence that we have to teach them, but model that. So I'm sorry, I diverted. I hope you remember what you're gonna say. Go Em, thank you. Well, I was just going to comment on what you were saying about being in the space of the anxiety or the hopelessness and then wanting to move out of it. And 
and give solutions and the reaction you're hoping for. Um, I'm no psychologist or anything, but that feels selfish in the sense that you are turning that situation from that person being vulnerable to you to you wanting to get out of that space and making it about yourself. You're, yeah. you're inheriting that emotion, whatever they're feeling, and then you yourself want to change it. So you start blurting out solutions and then to make yourself feel better, not make the other person feel better, especially if you're thinking about that kind of reaction you're hoping for. Absolutely. And um, I attended and I did a lot of training for anti-racism facilitation and conversations. And one piece of advice that I heard that I thought was very powerful is that before you even start giving um, solutions or anything um, is first, like you said, David, listen, but then also ask questions. Yes. Is, is what it, do you need from me? Is there anything I could do? What would feel good right now? Never offer advice until it's asked for. And if you're not sure, it's welcome. Thanks, Sam. That's so powerful. And thank you for letting everybody know how selfish I can be. <laughs> but it's so true. It is, and it's our anxiety. And I don't want to experience, I'm supposed to help you. And it, it, it's absolutely, it's powerful. It comes from the place of wanting to get out of anxiety. Okay, so that can be selfish. I think it also comes from a place of wanting to be helpful. And it feels good to be helpful. And that's sort of how we're part of why we go into it, but it doesn't feel helpful to the people we're trying to help. And I, I couldn't say it better than you. That's why I need you all because you have insights and gifts and, and your sharing will just enrich this whole experience. All right, so let us, so igniting the reward pathway by creating a relationship that where you lead with empathy, think about the power of it. If every time you emailed, every time you texted, every time you were in the presence of a student, your paradigm was, how do I create an emotional impact that, that communicates safety, caring, respect, and um, empathy? Because if you can do that, you will begin to be somebody that in your presence, you are a calming effect. You actually put, put them in emotional state where they are able to absorb information that you impart in the classroom and in the learning environment. It's such a cool thing to think about. Um, let me, um, let's continue and I will. Okay. So we went there. So here I am at the YMCA in 1964 in Boston, Massachusetts, getting ready to dive into the deep end because it's my swimming test. So fight, flight, or freeze. What is that boy? That's not actually me, right? I'm not that cute, but fight, flight, or freeze. What's that boy experiencing? That's freeze, right? I experienced that. I was standing over the board, looking down at the drain and imagining that's what I was gonna get sucked into and I was going to then die. I was gonna drown for sure. So I was completely frozen. And Don Fry was my swimming instructor and he was standing on the edge of the pool and there's a line of kids behind me. So I'm mortified as well as being completely paralyzed with fear. He says this, he goes, David, and he gets my attention. He goes, and he's looking at me, right? Look, grabbing my eyes. I would never let anything happen to you. I will be watching you the whole time. And if you get into any trouble, I will be in that water in a second and I will scoop you out. But I know you can do this. I've seen you build up to this point. You have the skill. Now, I was not completely unafraid, but I was no longer paralyzed. And I jumped in. Metaphorically, your students are on the edge of that diving board 
and they're peering into the depths, especially your students from diverse backgrounds who are suffering from already a sense that they don't belong and that, that has been reinforced societally and that have backgrounds where they know they don't have the same level of tools and experience. So they lack the equity. You're their Don Fry. And you establishing a relationship that gives them the faith and the courage and the trust to jump into the deep end of your classroom and your experience is critical to their success into overcoming that, that sense of exclusion and creating a sense of inclusion. The second way we ignite the reward pathway is when we create a sense of community within the environments we're instructing in. From an evolutionary perspective, you are always safer when you are not alone and you are always safer when you are a part of a group. One of my favorite expressions as a coach, a coach in college basketball was the strength of the wolf is in the pack and the strength of the pack is in the wolf. There is a, a symbiotic relationship between you being attached to and a part of a group that cares about you, that would miss you if you're gone, that accepts you warts and alls, that you are known to, that you don't have to pretend you can be yourself and you're still accepted. When those conditions exist, the reward pathway is ignited because from an evolutionary perspective, you are safer. Your chances of surviving the world grow precipitously. The worst thing you could do in a hunter-gatherer community would be to excommunicate. Apart from a group, we can't survive, not just psychologically, but physiologically. So we thrive in community and in support. There's this powerful book, The Checklist Manifesto. And in that book, this surgeon, Atul Gawande, did a little, um, he did a study with surgical teams. And he changed, they all have checklists, right? Surgical teams like airline pilots, when you're doing something, it's life and death critical. Checklists are an inherent part of it because you can't rely on people's memories because we get nervous, we get distracted, we forget things. So he added one thing to the checklist. And the one thing he added was in these surgical teams, everybody would know everybody's name. And they studied and what they determined was when you added that to the checklist and people became less anonymous and there was a sense of being known and more of a sense of community, people were more apt to speak up, to share information with each other and surgical outcomes improved just by feeling known and by being feeling a sense of being connected by knowing each other's names. This is so powerful. I wanna share with you an interview and I'm smart enough to know that I have to do it this way. What is a circle of safety and why should organizations consider building one? So the outside world is fraught with danger, you know, things that want to kill you. You know, in caveman times, it would have been, you know, saber toothed tiger or the weather or lack of resources, you know, things that are trying to end your life, you know? Well, in the modern business world, the things that are trying to kill you, quote unquote, are, you know, the, the, unpredictable nature of the stock market or a new technology that shows up out of nowhere and renders your business model useless or your competition who may want to actually put you out of business or maybe they just want to steal your customers or deny you customers you know um, these are all pressures that if not uh, if left unchecked will will kill you will put you out of business right these are a constant and this is the danger of the outside world 
the, the, the dangers inside an organization are a variable. Um, and a circle of safety is something that leaders provide. They, they draw a circle of safety around their people and they say, um, if I keep you safe internally and you do not fear any dangers internally, then you are more likely to work together, trust each other and cooperate to face the dangers externally. And only when there's a strong circle of safety is there innovation. Innovation requires risk and experimentation and failure. And if people fear that they might lose their jobs simply because they tried and failed or lost some money, then they won't try. And so there is no innovation. Um, this is the joke that so many organizations pound people and say, if you come up with something big, we'll give you a big bonus. But if you fail, we'll fire you. Or even if that risk exists, they are destroying innovation in their company. The responsibility of leadership is two things. To decide uh, how porous that circle of safety is. And in other words, who should we let in? We can only let in people that we'd want to trust and that we that would trust us. In other words, people who believe what we believe, who share our value set, right? You, if you let in someone just because they're qualified but they don't share your values, they're like cancer. They'll destroy it. Mm -hmm. That's number one. The other thing is how big to make the circle. Some leaders make the circle of safety only around themselves and their board and their senior executives. They're the safe ones, but everybody else can fend for themselves. In fact, worse, they'll sacrifice everybody else to keep themselves safe. These are very weak organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, the strongest org I want to stop there and talk about this circle of, oh my goodness. I apologize. Sometimes it would have been, you know, saber tooth tiger or the weather. The outside world is fraught with danger, you know, things. So um, let's talk a little bit, and I'm going to share one screen with you, and then we're going to um, we're going to work on this second. How do you operationalize this circle of safety? How do you create conditions where, in your learning environments, where people feel that there is a community that they're involved with. Simon also talked about that the Marines put people in positions when they train them where they will fail without each other's help. They create cooperative, collaborative, codependent environments that encourage connection. And in doing so, you begin to build a circle of safety as people become dependent upon each other, become known to each other, and become humanized with each other. So if we can take these five C's and incorporate them into our learning environments, and anytime you're having a learning experience, you say, how do I create a cooperative, collaborative, codependent activity that will connect them to each other and create conditions under which they become known to each other and have to cooperate with each other to produce something. When we do that, we are helping to ignite the reward pathway, pathway by creating a sense of community. When people feel known, they feel safer. When they don't feel anonymous, they feel more of a sense of value and belonging. And if we structure our learning as if it's an individualistic thing, we never tap into igniting the reward pathway by creating a sense of community. So this is a powerful tool in terms of our own pedagogy. I'd like to, just for a second, think about this for a moment. Can we popcorn out some things that you do already just to create connection. And I want to start with this. Often I've heard people say when I break them into groups or create pair shares and there's connections, I find that, that I'll walk around and sometimes they're not talking about the thing that we've assigned. Oh my God, that means they're human. That means they're trying to feel safe and connect with each other before they do the work. 
That means that they want to be known by each other. Don't think of that as wasting time. Think of that as building community. Remember, you're trying to alter the emotional state of your learning environment to create a sense of community that ignites the reward pathway, that ameliorates the stress, that puts them in a position where there's a sense of um, inclusion and being valued and being known. You have to allow them time to break down the barriers. Really quick, let's just popcorn out some things that you do, to, and you might not even thought of it in this context, that create that circle of safety or create community in how your learning environment operates. And we'll just share them with each other just quickly. There's so many things we could do. Does anybody want to start? I'll go. Thanks, uh, Jed. Appreciate it, bro. Uh, in one workshop, I had people share as a icebreaker share one boring thing about themselves very cool how's that for humanizing right instead of self-deprecating and putting us all on that same level yeah that's beautiful somebody else thank you jed i'm not going to say this has been always successful for me but i try to establish study groups that they uh, work with each other outside of the classroom and I'll have assignment on Google Sheets so I can go in and see who contributed and um, yeah so I've been doing that. Yeah study groups so. a lifeline you're not alone you're not alone you've got a group of people a group uh, a resource that you can go to and then trying to do things to create um, assignments that get that study group having to collaborate or create something will assist in building that community. Somebody else, what do we got? I just tried this um, for the first time last semester, but uh, for my intro psych students, their exam one tends to be the hardest. The, the, you know, they're getting used to my class. So I did handwritten notes to the students who improved 10% um, or more from exam one to exam, exam two. Beautiful. All right. That's working on igniting your war pathway by your relationship with them. That's powerful. Somebody else? Creating connection or community and how you um, try to impart your content is what we're talking about. Um, I'm not a faculty. I'm a staff, um, uh -huh. but I have student workers, so I still have that so, small sense of community. And uh, we were in a transition between um, a previous supervisor that we're working for and then myself. And to bridge that gap of who is this strange lady going to be my supervisor now, yeah, yeah. Um, I did a, a small introduction. We met face to face in person because um, I, I personally value that personal uh, in-person connection rather than just seeing a face in Zoom. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we did an in-person introduction. I shared my background, um, not just professional background, but who I am as a person. So they see me as more than just their supervisor, but more as a person they can go to if, yeah. if they ever need um, assistance or anything, or if they just want to chat, because a lot of the times students just want to talk. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't always want to talk about work or school, and they just want to share, share um, what they did over the weekend. That's powerful. Asking questions about them and not their work is a way to break through that. I value you as a person, not just How's that homework going? How's that writing assignment going? Where are you on the project? Let's talk about your last grade. Um, but if, if you know things about them or what do you like? I heard you were going to that movie. How was that? Just asking them questions about who they are and creating that connection. How about this? Allowing them to do that with each other like Jed did with sharing a boring fact. What's your favorite movie? Each of you exchange. Um, um, show one picture on your phone that you think really tells a lot about who you are in your group, in each group, and say why. You're trying to break down barriers and make them feel safe in each other's presence also. 
because if they don't feel safe with each other, you're never going to get a cooperative or engaged learning environment where they're sharing in front of each other. And just have faith that this sense of community, it will ameliorate the stress. And our students from diverse backgrounds, this, this could not be more critical. Even if they trust you, they know that they're, they're two of 25 people and they feel different and they're not gonna feel safe. It's their life. And you've got to do things to create connection and a sense of safety and a sense of community. And how you get them collaborating and connecting to each other is vital to that. As a college basketball coach, one of the most critical aspects in us being um, reaching our full potential was my players caring about each other, liking each other, and, and trying to support each other. I had to try to put them in conditions where I, you created those bonds. Otherwise, they're not going to work hard for each other. Okay, let's go to something that I hope will be helpful. All right, let me try this again. Stop share. Okay, the third way to ignite the reward pathway. So we've got safe, caring, resonant relationship. That has to be consistent in all your communications. Creating with the five C's, collaborative, connected, cooperative, codependent learning environments. And thirdly, this is the good news. Problem solving pattern finding is an innate igniter of the reward pathway. Because as a species, we survive by looking out into our external world. And when we had when we resolved or discovered patterns that assisted us in our survival, we got this reward. Thinking and problem solving and pattern science will create, look at these kids playing this video game. They're getting surges of dopamine and serotonin when they solve the puzzles, when they get the princess out of the dungeon, when the bells go off, when they get points, when whatever the, the context of the game is. You have to remind these kids to eat. You have to remind these kids to sleep because they're so enthralled. It becomes addictive. And it's not just them. Look, here's how this is going to work. That's a picture of Mount Everest. We have to be the good Sherpas. We are trying to position our students in an emotional state that will alter their body and brain chemistry toward empowerment, a sense of safety, and an ability for cognition and creative thought and persistence. You're the good Sherpa the one trying to guide them up to Mount Everest. You say to them first, we've talked about this, safe relationship. I care about you. I'm not going to let anything bad happen to you. You can trust me. And I've helped many, many people up this mountain. That is my course. And I'm going to help you. That ignites the reward pathway. Yeah, but you don't know me that well. And I'm a student from a background that you're unfamiliar with. Empathy and connection and working on building trust every day. Secondly, you say to them, look around you. You see all those blue tents in the foreground? Those are your teammates. We're going up the mountain together. Those are your classmates. And you create that sense of community and collaboration. We are not leaving anybody behind. That ignites the reward pathway to the extent that you're able to build a circle of safety and a safe resident community and allow them opportunities to connect, to be known by each other and to be helped by each other. And thirdly, you scaffold the learning. So right now they're paralyzed with fear because they're staring at the top of the mountain. You go, wait a minute, look at the uh, cursor. 
We're not, don't even worry about the top of the mountain right now. We're just going to right here, these foothills. That's all we're doing right now. And when you get there, you celebrate it. You don't ask more of your students than they're capable of giving at that moment in time. You skillfully create learning challenges that can be met with your support, with the team and community support, so they can build their sense of confidence and efficacy. That's so critical. You think like a slot machine. Here's the metaphor. Your students are sitting at the slot and they're pulling the lever. They're giving effort. They're trying to survive your course. They're constantly putting in quarters of effort. If they don't hit a jackpot at some point, relatively quickly, if they don't experience some sense of progress or success, their motivation will wane and eventually they'll get up from that slot and they'll move away and they'll stop depositing the coins of effort. If they've had lots of experience of pulling down slots and not winning anything, their behavior will get extinguished, the, the effort will get extinguished more quickly. We have to provide progress. We have to scaffold the learning so when they pull the lever in a classroom, there's a sense of progress. You celebrate it, you note it, you make them aware of it, and you remind them of it. So they want to come back, sit down at your metaphorical slot machine and keep depositing coins of effort. Slot machines are designed by motivational psychologists, just like video games, to constantly tap into igniting the reward pathway by creating conditions where problems get solved. There's a reward. And with that reward comes that surge of motivation, dopamine, adrenaline. All right, let's put this all together. Here's a critical piece to all of this. The neuroscience on learning, here's what we know. First attempts in learning result in failure. Mastery over anything requires repeated, persistent attempts to develop expertise, to translate knowledge into skill, to become good at writing, to become good at math, to become good at science. What the growth mindset teaches us, what we've learned is that the brain is pliant. Brain plasticity, you grow intelligence by constantly firing neurons until they're wired. And it requires multiple attempts. What I try to teach my students is that learning requires multiple cognitive passes over the information, over the skill you're trying to develop. And there will be many, many misses. Look at that child. That child did not just stand up and begin walking. There were multiple attempts at rolling over, sitting up, kneeling, hoisting themselves up, but they were supported and they, was, they were put in an emotional state where encouragement didn't overwhelm them. And eventually they learned to walk. We want our students, they have to become comfortable with the failure that comes with the process of learning. So their emotional state and their morale is our, is our primary focus. We've got to guide them through those multiple failed attempts. And if we're dealing with students that are coming in with backgrounds where they haven't been as prepared or where there's more of a sense of anxiety and a sense of exclusion, we have to acknowledge and teach them 
that you're not doing math. Here's the magic word. You don't have this. It is not a sign that you don't belong in college. It is simply a sign that you are on a path towards learning. And you have, they have to trust you and you have to surround them with supportive community and give them learning activities where they experience some sense of progress after multiple cognitive passes to build their sense of efficacy. You teach them how learning works, that they're building up, just like you build up muscle strength, you're building up brain strength by, by constant repetition and attempts at whatever it is they're trying to learn. And there'll be, there'll be non-perfect attempts and that's okay. It's not a sign you're not intelligent. It is simply a sign you're on the path towards learning. If we don't provide the emotional support to frame these attempts of not that lead to non-perfect outcomes, their behavior will often extinguish. We've got to teach them this. It's not IQ and your in innately born college material. It's persistent effort, persistent mindful effort. Where do they get the motivation and the inspiration to keep putting in effort when it's hard and they're not meeting with immediate success. That you're igniting the reward pathway through your relationship, through the community you surround them with, and by skillfully scaffolding the learning and calibrating it to where they are so they experience some success and progress before they start to feel hopeless or overwhelmed. And you teach them that you teach them what Edison had to learn. So when they ask Edison, oh my God, the light bulb, it was like 2000 attempts and you kept being wrong. How did you persist? Because I wasn't wrong 2000 times. It was a 2000 step process. That's growth mindset. Your students are going to catch something from you and the class environment that you establish. It's going to either create stress and anxiety and multiply their sense that they don't belong here, that you don't get them, that this college doesn't understand what they came from and what they deal with, or you're going to ignite the reward pathway. We're trying to create, um, as mentors, a mindful state amongst ourselves that we can impact their emotional state with these, this, this insight into how to ignite the reward pathway and what are the conditions that will do so. Their emotional stability is an open loop system. It will be impacted by how you treat them and the way you structure your, your learning community and the way you design your learning challenges and the way you scaffold the content. So here's my, this is another not too proud story. I was flying from Tucson, Arizona back to, at the time when I lived in upstate New York, when I was still working at the, my college. And we were going, let's say, from Tucson to Atlanta. So we were flying over Dallas. I hope none of you are from Dallas because Dallas is one of my least favorite places. And I wasn't even in Dallas. I was flying over it. The pilot comes on and he tells us we're going to be hitting some turbulence. And it was right at the time when the flight attendants are coming out to serve us our pretzels or peanuts and our drink. I become irrational 
excited when I see them. I'm like my dog at dinner time. Again, if I'm traveling with my wife, I'll go, oh my God, what are you going to get? Are you going to get the pretzels or the peanuts? You get the pretzels, I'll get the peanuts, and then we'll switch. And I'm thinking, why don't I just ask for both? I just paid $500 for the flight, but I'm not brave enough. So they're doing that. They're coming in the aisles. And all of a sudden, we hit this pocket where it felt like, even though I was in my seat, I was falling. And I let out this sound that I don't think I've let out since I was maybe in, maybe a three-year-old. And I was not alone. Throughout this um, airplane, there were lots of audible shouts and sounds. And all of a sudden, to make matters worse, the flight attendant disappeared. They're like, oh my God, what happened? They were just there and all of a sudden they ducked down. When they came up and it stopped, I said to one of them, I said, what happened? Why did you do that? Why did you like go down? They said, oh, we're taught when we hit a patch like that, we've got to duck down so we don't fall into anybody and hurt them. And we hold onto the cart so the cart doesn't fly up and hurt anybody. Hmm. And when this flight attendant came up, she came up like this and she simply said, pretzels or peanuts? I was like, oh my God, do you have any Depends? Because that's what I think I need right now. I was, I was like so shook by what had just happened. But when they came up, they were trained. And they understood that my emotional stability on this very bumpy plane ride was an open loop system. And if they had come up with panic or fear or indifference, it would have helped spread my fear. But they came up calm and confident, like this ain't no big thing. And your students are on a very bumpy ride. And what this, all of our work together is to try to encourage you to think that their emotional stability, especially coming from these diverse backgrounds where they're already dealing with tremendous stress externally imposed by society, that their stability will be impacted by how you treat them, by the way you design your learning community, and by how conscious you are of allowing them to build confidence and experience success by how you structure and scaffold your learning. All right, this is, I get excited about this. So we know positive emotions, a sense of being cared for and safe, the buddy system, being surrounded by community and being given tasks that they have the capacity to complete, create positive emotions that expand their capacity. Here's your life hack. Here's your cheat sheet. How do we operationalize this in our learning communities? Coming in as an authority figure, our students are used to you being the one that judges them, that validates their value, or says what they do wrong. That is a nervous and scary condition. Your bureaucratic authority as the person that assigns grades and judges their worth within the context of your classroom already sets up a condition where in your presence, they're going to feel nervous. Nervous is cortisol and adrenaline. It inhibits cognition. They feel less safe and they feel less confident. How can we alter that? and ameliorate that knee-jerk reaction. Catching them not doing wrong, but doing right is a powerful paradigm shift. What if your job as a teacher was to scan and look for signs of effort and potential and good character and caring and you were constantly trying to notice the good things they were doing that will support their success and acknowledging it. 
And on a seven to one ratio, you looked to catch them doing right and affirm good behaviors and good effort as opposed to correcting and telling them what was wrong. You would create an emotional climate that would start to build their sense of efficacy. And if you're like any of the other educators I've worked with, say, yeah, David, but sometimes they need correction. And I'll agree with that. So I want to share with you what I, I gave you in an email, one particular document, and we're going to play around with it a little bit. So let me go to a new share. Let me pull this up. The an acronym that I use for this, we want to talk about how can you affirmatively mentor, especially students from diverse backgrounds, and how can you compassionately correct them without triggering this sense of, oh, I don't belong here, I'm a fraud, and, and increasing their sense of inadequacy or triggering old tapes of, I don't belong here, and this is not my place. So I want to give you this conversation template, and then we'll play around with it a little bit. The first part, the C stands for catch them doing right consistently. I'm going to speak truth to power. You cannot bullshit this. If you are not consistently creating conditions where you express that you value, respect, and care for them. When you try to talk to them in this manner, it is simply going to appear phony and disingenuous. You have got to constantly be igniting the reward pathway, building the relationship and the sense of trust, creating a circle of safety, and, and not asking more of them than they're able to give. If you're doing that, when you begin the talk and say, hey, um, I wanna run something by you. So Christine, you're in my little box, I see you. So I'll use you and say, so Christine, I'd love you to stop by. I wanna, I wanna run something by you, okay. When you, when the, see, it's not, I wanna talk to you about your poor grade, or I wanna talk to you about, I think you might be failing this class, or if you don't get your act together, all of that's gonna bump up the anxiety. And once remember they're fearful, they're not going to absorb the information. So you're going to go, hey, Christine, would, um, can you stop by my office? I got something I want to run by. When, when's a good time? Okay, so now we got that. When you start the talk where you're going to correct them about something or challenge a behavior that's getting in the way of the learning, you start with the A, appreciative reflection on their value, on the things you have caught them doing right. Um, I so appreciate and value your contributions in class, Christine. You do such an incredible job of trying to participate and you're so willing to share. And in your groups, you're so willing to take a leadership role. All right, but Christine, see, here's the thing. You dominate the class. You don't give other people an opportunity to speak. And I want to address that in a way that's compassionate and kind and preserves my positive relationship with you. So I go, I so appreciate and value your enthusiasm, your willingness to contribute. And I give lots of examples and I don't use the word, but. As soon as I use the word, but, you're gonna go, uh-oh, here it comes. I know it. If you've ever been in an evaluation where somebody goes, Dave, you're doing such a great job, but. As soon as you hear the but, you know, now, this is where you're going to be in some way demeaned, devalued, criticized, corrected. And it's going to trigger, especially in our more vulnerable students, anxiety that's going to make it hard for them to continue to trust you or want to come to you. So you go, I so appreciate and value your contribution. And, and isn't so. And then the P stands for positive aspirational vision of their future. And I think or believe 
you could be even more, a more powerful leader and even more helpful in class to me when we can, we is important. You've got skin in the game. You're their mentor, you're their coach. They're not in this alone. When we can find ways for you to contribute to the class and make room for other students to also contribute so they can also feel that sense of contribution and value from being helpful. I so appreciate all the things you do, Christine. Once in a while, I'm wondering if we can figure out a way so that we can start to build the confidence in our other students that are shyer than you are. And maybe you can help, do you have? And then the S, you're saying the behavior you want. It's not coddling, it's being very direct, but in a kind way. So how can we establish a system so that we create space for some of your teammates to be able to share in their groups? And then the question, how can we do that? How can we get there? What can I do to help? Because this is going to be so helpful to your development and growth, and you're going to help me. And I think you can really help these students to grow because they don't have the confidence that you have right now. When you approach in this manner, you're going to create conditions under which your students are going to feel not as threatened while you're compassionately creating a sense of correction. This is not something, it's like leading with empathy, that will come naturally or normally to your students. It's something that you'll have to practice. It's a skill, just like anything else. And over time, the more and more you work this template and remind yourself of it and use it before you have these corrective, compassionate, corrective conversations, this affirmative mentoring conversations with your students, especially your students from diverse backgrounds, the more skilled you will become at helping them to grow and affecting their behavior and changing their behavior while at the same time preserving a trustful relationship and give, not triggering a sense of inadequacy that they've so often experienced. So that is something I'll share with you and, I'll, and I will encourage you to take that template and to practice it because you won't get good at it until you practice it. And after you practice it a while, it'll become second nature. 